All right, so we're going to be starting chapter two. And chapter two now is on graphical displays. And so we've talked about collecting data, about di different types of sampling, about populations and samples, parameters and statistics and whatnot. And so now we're going to be looking at how to display this data graphically. All right, 2.1 is on stem and leaf graphs, also called stem plots, line graphs, and bar graphs. And um, just a little note here, in Alex, they call a line plot the same thing as we saw before when I was plotting the number of hours we sleep on average per night as a dot plot. Uh, we've got problems with bar graphs, tally graphs, or tally charts stem and leaf plots. So let's just look at these uh, problems. And there are some really cool examples in here. Uh, we may have even kind of looked at some of this before. But um, so yeah, if you're interested in, you know, seeing some different types of examples, you know, oftentimes we think of the stem as maybe like in the tens place or the hundreds place, and then the leaves in uh, in a place next to that. But it's also possible to have decimals. You know, maybe the stems are the whole numbers. Like, right, we have the two and then point three. So the leaves are the decimal parts. So anyways, you guys might want to check that out. But let's look at the Alex problems. And so we've got 31 homework problems for this week. Again, there are a lot of duplicates. And the first one is to construct that line plot. And so basically you've got a number, you're just gonna put an X right over the number. Pull up the explanation. Like here, there are two sixes. So you put two X's over the six, and then there are three eights and so on. Okay. So I'm just gonna pull up the answers here. And you might wanna just do one at a time, you know, from left to right. You can click the pencil, and when you click, you know, over the eight, it puts the X right over that. And then there's a nine, there are two more eights, a five, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's for a line plot. And then we have a bar graph for non-numerical data. So here, a new model of shirt at the clothing store comes in four colors. There were 16 shirts, and here they are by color, green, yellow, black, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then draw the bar graph for these data. And the way this works is you can pull up the bar, click and drag. And so we'll just see, ah, they used a tally chart to count the number of greens, the number of yellows, et cetera, to get those frequencies. And then you could just pull up those bars to the right heights, okay? I think these are all pretty straightforward, right? Let's just see if there's a different. The drink booth at the school fair had these type five types of drinks, iced tea, lemonade, apple cider, root beer, and orange juice. So you can see the five types and then 16 students and here they are. Okay, so you just wanna count those and then pull up the bars. Using a tally chart is fine, etc. All right, and then interpreting a bar graph. So here we have a hardware company has sales agents in four different states. The number of agents in each state is shown in the bar graph. 
So you can see here, there were 11 agents in Indiana, four in Ohio, et cetera. So which state has the most? Clearly it's the tallest bar, right? So Indiana, which has 11. How many more agents are in Indiana than in Ohio? Right, so there were 11 here, there are four here. So for how many more, you would just subtract, right? And how many states have more than five? So you could, you know, kind of eyeball. And we see there's just one bar that surpasses that five mark, right? So one state. So these, I think, also are pretty straightforward. Um, number of t-shirts sold in these different colors, which had the fewest. So that's going to be blue. How many of those? There are four, et cetera. Okay. At least 10. So that means 10 or more. And there was one color. So these are just reading and understanding these bar graphs. Let me just see. So Alex really goes into some detail for each question, right? Which is nice. It's nice, right? How to read across the heights. Okay. Interpreting a double bar graph. So we start out pretty basic, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Quan Corporation has four departments. The double bar graph below shows how many male and female employees in each department. So in advertising, right, the solid red is the male. There are 100 males and looks like 125 females in advertising, right? So estimate the number of females in sales. So that's going to be the striped bar. So I'd say like 240, and hopefully they have some kind of good, you know, if you put 235, hopefully it would still take it. But if not, I mean, it's the, these questions that just aren't that big of a deal, right? It's more about understanding. If you put like 239, <laughs> you know, it's still a reasonable guess. And which ones have more males than females? So that's where the red bar is higher than the striped bar. And the total number of employees in accounting, so now you're going to add together, there are 100 males and maybe 140 females. So you add those together, right, to get the 240. Okay. So that's the, you know, again, the binomial gender. Let's just see what else. All right here we have three libraries in Glen City. So there's Central, Hillside, and Valley. Each library has fiction and nonfiction books. So I, I much prefer these types of questions. Just not as offensive. Um, and again, you could just answer the questions by making sense of the double bar graph. Uh, right, at Valley, estimate the number of nonfiction. So that's the striped. And again, you want to kind of imagine a line going across so you could read, you know, sure, 400. Okay. All right, the double bar graph, uh, stem and leaf. So as part of a survey, 15 adults were asked, how many hours did you spend at your job last week? And so here we had somebody say, and I like how they give a key, which explains how to read the graph. So two slash one means 21 hours. So the stem is the number of tens, and then the leaves are the number of ones. 
So what's the highest number of hours worked in the 30s, you guys? Right, this is the row with the 30s. Somebody worked 31 hours, somebody worked 32, somebody worked 37, someone worked 39. So the highest number is 39. The highest overall is 58. How many responses in the 20s? There was just one response. Okay. Let's just see if the explanation has any great words of wisdom. I do kind of like how they do this, right? They show this example where three is the number of tens, and then there's a one leaf, a two leaf, a seven, and a nine, et cetera. Again, I always feel like there are different people coding all of these problems. So sometimes I really like them and sometimes I don't. <laughs> but I mean, overall, I would say they're pretty darn good. But, you know, I'm splitting hairs. Uh, the stem and leaf, leaf display below gives the amounts of money and dollars spent by the Bell family in their last 17 trips. Wow. To an amusement park. That's a lot of trips. Um, so two, one, and then a, a slash and a one means 211, okay? So this is still the number of tens. You have 21 tens or 200s and one ten, right? And then the leaves, again, are the number of singles or units or ones, whatever, okay? So like how many in the 240s? There were two. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I just laugh at that. I mean, I guess kind of in in Southern California, sometimes there are people who get those you know season passes for like Disneyland and stuff, and they go all the time. That was definitely okay. Constructing a frequency distribution and a histogram. Okay, so here are the hottest recorded temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for each of 18 cities throughout North America. Complete the grouped frequency distribution for the data. Note that the class width is six. So notice like 94 and a half plus six gives you 100 and a half. Right, so you're adding six. 100 and a half plus six gives you 106 and a half. So the class widths are six. So you're just going to count how many are in this group and give the frequency, how many in that group, give the frequency. And then again, you can pull up to the frequency. So we'll see the Alex version here, explanation. Right, so in that first class, there are those four. And then they show the frequency for each class. And then once you have the frequency, again, between 94 and a half and 100 and a half, you just pull that bar up to that height. And for the five, that's the next bar, et cetera. Okay. And so they have all of them shown here. Again, I feel like this is pretty straightforward. Um, although easy to make a mistake. So Mr. Powell gave his students a biology test. Here are the test scores. Complete the group frequency distribution for the data. Note that the class width is five. Right? So you're going to add five to 78.5, et cetera. And just count the number in um, each group. And then you're going to pull the bar up to that frequency. Okay. Just in the interest of time. Okay. They talk more about the class widths on this problem, or maybe it's another one. Okay. So. 
All right. Draw the histogram for the data. And the data, it says the heights and in inches for a sample of 15 male adults are given here. And notice on this problem, you're allowed to send the data to the calculator. And while it's highlighted, it's handy, you can press sort. And this will sort the data for you from smallest to highest, enabling you to, you know, more easily count like how many are in a particular class. And so for this problem, they give you an initial class boundary of 61.5 and then a class width of six. So you just keep adding six, add six, add six, and then count the number in that class. So for this first one, I'll pull up the Alex explanation here. Um, a histogram, as we saw before, it's a graphical summary of frequency distribution of a data set. So we have groups of data values. When constructing a histogram, it's necessary to break up the range of data values into different classes and then count the number of observations that fall into each class. Okay, so for this problem, you start at 61.5 and you have a class width of six. The initial class boundary is the left endpoint of the first class here. Okay, so that's where we're starting. And the class width is the width of the interval defining each class. So again, you've added six, and so you get 67.5. Okay. Um, notice this point here. And this different books and different resources will use different conventions for, you know, are the endpoints included or not? And what Alex does consistently, and they really should consistently, you know, include the lower boundary of a class. So this is included, but not the upper boundary. So if you had a data point of 67.5, it would be included in the next group, you know, the next class, okay? And if you guys remember that kind of interval notation where the set brackets include the endpoint, the parenthesis, does not. Okay, so this is an Alex convention here. This is one I wanted to make sure that I pointed out. All right. And again, they show the sorted data. And so you want to look at how many are between 61 and a half and 67 and a half. Right, and there's just that one. And then look between 67 and a half and 73 and a half. And so you've got one, two, three, four, five. Et cetera, et cetera. Now notice, I mean, just so as to not trip in anybody up, notice they tend to give you the halves and the data are all holes. So you kind of don't even need to worry about this convention. And I believe they're pretty consistent on that too, just because they want to make sure you know how to do the basic idea here. Uh, um. So you determine the frequency for each class and bring those up. In a histogram, classes are displayed on the horizontal axis and frequencies are displayed on the vertical axis. And you get rectangles whose width indicate the classes and the heights indicate the frequencies. The classes are labeled by their left and right endpoints. Sometimes midpoints are used because notice the heights are the same because you have a rectangle. 
Um, and we are going to also be looking at frequency polygons coming up. And they're both ways of summarizing, you know, frequency distribution graphically. And we're going to see that a frequency polygon has these dots and line segments instead of rectangles. So we'll be looking at that. So, all right, now notice this problem. So this topic in Alex gives you the class boundaries two different ways. Remember the last one, we started at 61.5 and you were told that the class width was six. And so you just kept adding the class width. Here, they give you the initial class and the ending class and they tell you that there are five classes of equal width. Okay, so you're gonna subtract to find the difference and then divide by five to get the width of each class. Okay, you subtract on the top, you get 25 and then divided by five, so you get five. So these are the two different ways this topic appears. And all the rest is the same. Then you're gonna you know, sort the data and see how many are in each class and pull up those bars. Okay. So let's see, a sample of 18 participants took part in a hearing experiment. Um, the absolute hearing threshold in decibels, decibels were measured and here they are. And so here you have an initial class boundary of 17.5 and an ending of 37.5. and you want five classes of equal width. So you wanna take the difference, which gives you 20, and then divide that by five. So that gives you a class width of four. So you're gonna start the initial class boundary 17.5, and then add four, add four, Add four, add four. Because if you don't have enough, you can add columns. Because we want the ending class boundary to be 37.5. Okay. So that's just labeling these, you know, boundaries, and then you can send the data to the calculator. While it's highlighted, click on sort. Okay. And so between 17.5 and 21.5, there's just the one number 18. And then between 21.5, I don't think it'll let me write on here. As soon as I let go to write, you know, the it scrolls to the right. And you can't even see anymore. So it makes it kind of difficult for me to use the pen and show you. But between 21.5, so there's 22, 23, 23, and 25, right? So we've got four, and then between 25.5 and 29.5. So we're gonna start at 26. So we've got 26, 27, and that's it, two. And then between 29 and a half and 33 and a half. So we've got 30, 30, 30, 
31, we have to include the 33s, and there are three of them. Go ahead, four and three is seven. And then between 33 and a half to the end, so you're gonna include 34, 35, and 37, that's three. And let's see if they add up to 18. We've got seven and three is 10, six, missed one somewhere. Why do I have a feeling it's that one? Did you guys do it as well or no? 30 to 33 and a half. They're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it. 25 and a half to 29 and a half. So one, two, three. Ah. There are three, right? The 26s and the 27. Okay. So that's histograms for group data. Let me just see. So I kind of went beyond number eight already. Let me just click back here. Okay. So our lecture notes, again, just kind of go over these different types of histograms that Alex convention of including the lower boundary, but not the upper. And then there are also relative frequency histograms. So this is where you have decimals or percentages. So it's relative to the whole. So let's just continue on with relative frequency histograms. So the Daily Online Newspaper, America at a Glance, has just published an article detailing a study of 50 students who completed preparation programs for a nationwide standardized test. Following histogram, which summarizes the math test score information for the 50 sample students, appeared in the article. So based on the histogram, find the proportion of math test scores that are at least 650. Okay, so this is saying that 12% were between 550 and 600, 24% were between 600 and 650. So at least 650, you're going to be adding all of these to the right. Should be adding these 40, 64%. And we can see the Alex explanation here. Okay, so they don't have a lot of extra information. A relative frequency is a frequency expressed as a proportion or percentage of the total number of measurements. Okay. Uh, and there were three classes that measured at least 650. Right, this one with the 30%, the 24%, and the 10%. So you just add them together. Um, anagram puzzles involve sets of scrambled letters that must, must be rearranged to form words. A standard intelligence test employs these puzzles as an aid in assessing verbal ability. The histogram below summarizes information about the time for completion in seconds for each of 25 students. So now, notice we're given a frequency rather than a relative frequency, right? We show four, uh, four students 
who completed between 500 and 700 seconds. Nine of the 25 students completed between 700 and 900 seconds. And so again, now they're looking for, you know, the proportion who completed uh, the sample that are at least 900. So you could add all these and divide by 25, or you could do one at a time and add them. I would personally add them all together. No, six and six is 12 out of 25. And it's nice that they're giving you a nice denominator because to get a percentage, you can just multiply by four, right? Because that's a fraction that equals one. So you get 48 out of 100, or 48%. They say to write as a decimal, so 0. 0.48. Right? And again, that's in all of these. Let's just see the Alex explanation. So they did each one separately, which is fine. Ah, okay. And and in they did each one separately to show the relative frequency. So between 500 and 700, right, there were four students out of 25, that's 16%. And here there were nine students out of 25, that's 36%, et cetera, et cetera. So they show each one, but in the end, they did the same thing I did. <laughs> Okay, they, they show you could have added together those three. Or we could get this another way and added to get the 12 out of 25. Okay, so they show both ways, which is nice. All right, so we saw one that gave percentages and one that gave the whole numbers where you find the percentage, right? So you just wanna be careful to read the question all the time. I'll just do another one just to make sure. Um, AccuRating has just released its webcast report for last month. The report details the aggregate tuning hours for the top 20 radio stations broadcast over the web. Um, aggregate tuning hours are ATHs. The ATH for a station is the sum total of all hours that listeners tuned to the station. So the report displays the following histogram. So 15%, you know, had between 200 and 400 aggregate tuning hours, et cetera, et cetera. So notice the y-axis here, it's given in relative frequency. And so you're given the decimals already. And not all of the questions are gonna be greater than or equal to either like we've seen, that's just been coincidence. But okay, so here greater than or equal to um, 600 hours. You're looking to the right. So you've got 20% plus 40% is 60% plus 10% is 70%, 0. 0.7. So now that I've said that, let's just see one that, okay, here, less than. <laughs> just so we're kind of being complete. A professional golfer is shopping for a new brand of golf ball. 
She likes most of the features of one particular brand, but she wants to make sure that the brand has a desirable spin rate. And I'll tell you, golfers are crazy about these balls and all of this. Um, the rate at which the ball spins on its axis after being struck by a golf club. Because you could imagine if it spins more easily, it's going to go farther, right? I played a little virtual golf. <laughs> Anyways, to test the spin rate, the golfer hits the brand of ball on 100 shots and the computer measures the spin rate for each shot. The computer then produces the following histogram. I imagine this is exactly the type of thing that they do. This might be a little oversimplified, but you could imagine this is what they do to test. Um, so the golfer hits the brand of balls on 100 shots. So nine of the shots had a spin rate between 5,000 and 5,500 revolutions per minute, right? 10 shots between here and here. So here we're given just a regular frequency, not a relative frequency, right? It's just a straight frequency not a relative frequency. These are whole numbers. These are out of 100, which makes it easy though. Nine out of 100 is 9% or 0.09, right? So, I mean, I got to give it to Alex for making the numbers nice, just so you're not killing yourself with the arithmetic, you know? Um, so it's easy to find the relative frequencies. And then find the proportion that are less than 6,500. So now you're adding these to the left. So you've got 25, 35, and 9 is 44%, right? 0.44. Okay. Let me just try to... Add those up, okay. All right. All right, shapes of discrete distributions. So I actually took this I believe all from Alex anyway. Um, so there are several different terms we use to describe the shapes of histograms um, or different features of histograms. So we can talk about a peak like here or here. We have two peaks. So a singular peak is a histogram. We would call it a uni or unimodal histogram. And here you have a bimodal histogram because there are two peaks. And here we have, you know, three peaks. If you have three or more, we just say it's multimodal. So again, we use language a lot to describe, you know, what's going on. And sometimes it might be a little questionable. Are you going to call that a peak or not? And I mean, it's just you know, it's kind of up to the author or the person for how they want to describe. As long as it makes sense, you're good, you know. Um, a symmetric histogram is one where the left half is a mirror image of the right half. So this dotted line, it's meant to be a mirror right down the middle. You could picture folding that along the dotted line. It would line up. Um, a uniform histogram is one where all the bars are the same height. Um, a bell-shaped histogram, as it says, kind of looks like a bell. So this kind of histogram, it's um, symmetric. It has one peak. It's unimodal, which is in the middle. Other bars to the left and the right decrease in height the farther away they are from the peak. Um, we can talk about a tail. So notice here, right? you could think about the shape of this having a tail, this long tail that extends to the left. And so we say that 
you know, this is either negatively skewed or skewed to the left. So the skew direction refers to the tail. Um, and here you have one skewed to the right, positively skewed. Okay. And, I, you know, they don't necessarily have to fit perfectly. Like it doesn't have to, you, you don't need to have a graph that is like perfectly uniform. You might say something like, you know, the data has a graph that is approximately uniform, or the data are shown in a graph that is roughly L-shaped. Okay, literally all this language to refer to not exactly, but, you know, close to, okay? So shapes of discrete distributions. So which histogram is best described as bimodal? What do you guys think? 2 peaks A B or C A right it looks like you know there's a peak and there's a peak right uh the closest to being symmetric probably B right the left and the right are you know pretty close uh, skewed the most to the right. B. So that's this one, right? The tail. Oops. And the closest to being bell shaped. Right. B is more bell shaped. Okay. Easy schmeasy so far, right? That's great. Just see what else, y'all. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So there are more, um, types of histograms. Here we have a cumulative distribution. Um, so this is a cumulative relative frequency polygon is called an ogive, not an ogive, but an ogive. And, um, you know, basically we find they want the relative frequency. So you would take the 27 out of the 100, right, for your first relative frequency, and then add to that the 26 out of 100. So 26% plus 27% gives you 53%. So you're, you're you know, so now you've got 53% commuting, you know, up to eight miles. So each point is cumulative. Instead of doing one for 27% and one for 26%, one for 18%, you're going to keep adding so it's cumulative. And this is called an ogive. So you've got your given frequencies in the initial chart right? Not relative frequencies, but frequencies, although close enough to figure a relative frequency. These are all just divided by 100. So these are the relative frequencies. And then to plot the ojav, you just keep adding up the next relative frequency. You started at 27%, and you're going to add 26%. Now you have 53%, you're gonna add 18%. So 18 and 53 gives you 71. 71 plus 13 gives you 84. 84 plus 11 gives you 95. 95 plus five gives you 100% or one. Okay. 
So these ogives are, are pretty cool. So it's a variation of a relative frequency polygon in which cumulative relative frequencies are plotted instead of relative frequencies. So let's check out some of these ogives. That name just kind of cracks me up. So let's see. I think we start out maybe just with cumulative frequency polygons. So let's see. Miss Martinez gave her students a biology test. Here are the test scores. Complete the grouped frequency distribution. So first, you know, you can send the data to the calculator and sort it and give the frequencies for each class. And Using the classes, draw the frequency polygon. Okay, for a frequency polygon, we're going to plot the midpoint and then the frequency. So let's pull up the, the Alex explanation here first. Okay, so first they do all the frequencies right, in each class. And then they find the midpoint for each class. So to find a midpoint, you can always add the endpoints together and divide by two. Okay, you could also note here that the class width is four. Right, notice you've added four. And so the midpoint, you're gonna add two. <laughs> from the left, 71 and a half plus two gives you 73 and a half, right? And so there's four in between there. And so the midpoint is, you know, either add to or you could subtract to from the endpoint. Just saying. Okay. And so again, you're going to plot down here the midpoint, and then you're going to do the frequency for that class. So we had two in this first class with the midpoint of 73.5. And then four with the next one, a midpoint of 77.5, et cetera. And so we draw these lines and, you know, and use the dots and lines instead of having the rectangles. Okay. So this is called a frequency polygon, again, as opposed to a histogram. The obvious difference in display, frequency polygons have dots and lines, and histograms have the rest rectangles. Oops, I had one job. <laughs> All right, so here are shopping times for each of 15 shoppers. Uh, complete the grouped frequency distribution. Note the class width is odd. So you can send the data to the calculator and sort it and get the frequency for each class. So between, it, it takes so long to do. <laughs> Just going to pull it up. So there are two between 17 and a half and 22 and a half, the 18 and the 20. And then we have five between 22 and a half and 27 and a half. The 24s, the 26 and the 27, it's the five, et cetera. And then to get the midpoint for this first class, Again, you could add them together. And divide by two. So that's the midpoint there.
or you know since the class width is five you could add two and a half on the left <laughs> that's the other way to think about it add two and a half because that's half of five So 17 and two is 19, and then you have two halves, that gives you the 20. Add two and a half, you get 25. Add two and a half, you get 30. Add two and a half, you get 35. And then plot those frequencies above the midpoints. Okay. So I think I I actually missed that. Or maybe I didn't have that on there. I guess I didn't have one of these on there. All right. So that's a frequency polygon. Cumulative distribution and O drives. All right. So notice here, we're given a frequency as opposed to um, a relative frequency. Methadone is a synthetic drug whose effect on the body is similar to that of morphine and heroin. Methadone has been used to help people control their addictions to these other drugs. The following histogram summarizes information from a study of 25 methadone clinic patients. In the study, the daily dosage for each patient was recorded. Okay, so three patients had between zero and 50 milligrams of methadone, and eight out of the 25 patients had between 50 and 100, et cetera. All right, so we wanna get that cumulative frequency So you start out at zero, so we're good there. And then three out of the 25 had between zero and 50. So three out of 25, I don't know where I should write it. Three out of 25, multiply top and bottom by four to get 100 on the bottom. So that's 12% there. So between 0 and 50, you had 12%. So yeah, I should keep it right here. You can kind of see everything. There. So 8 out of 25 multiplied by 4. 32%. So now you're going to add that to the 12% and you get 44%. And then the 9 Multiply by four, you get 36. So you're going to add 36 to the 44%. So that's 80. And then you've got three again. I don't need to do that again, right? It's 12%. So I'm going to add 12% to 80 and get 92%. And of course, the last one is going to be the last 8%.
hundred percent is born. I am a grown up, I swear. <laughs> Just laugh. It reminds me kind of like, oh, snap. Oh, sorry. Go I have ahead. a question. Um, sure. I got lost on the, where did you get the, the four? Like two, two times four, like the four over four? Like all of these? Uh huh. I'm converting to a percentage. And so to get a percentage, you need 100 on the bottom. So I know, you know, like if I want to convert this to hundredths, I ask myself, what do I multiply by on the bottom? And it's 25 times four. And if I multiply by four on the bottom, I have to multiply by four on the top because that's a fraction that equals one. And so I'm multiplying three twenty-fifths by one. So I haven't changed the value of it. When you multiply by one, you haven't changed the value. Does that make sense? You could also use the calculator, but I hate to, you know, <laughs> it's one of my little pet peeves. For all of us adults, you know, that we need to really know how to do some basic arithmetic, I think. So I really want to encourage everybody to kind of learn these, you know, arithmetic things. Because really, like I do this in my head, I'm only writing it out for you guys, you know, to kind of see. And so we can all see on the on the whiteboard, you know what I'm saying? But when you have a denominator of 25 or 50 or 100, I mean, it's just a shame to have to use a calculator because you could just multiply by four or multiply by two or multiply by one. I mean, you don't even multiply by one. So did that answer the question or no? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for asking that because see, maybe I glossed over that a bit as well. Um, and if you do want to, you know, in that fractions module, I have some, you know, some worksheets to remind us and you have some practice on stuff like this, because I can appreciate it. Like you might not have done this in a while, you know, for sure. So, okay, let's see. All right, so we're perfectly at the halfway mark. Let's take a break and we'll come back at a quarter after, okay. Welcome back, everybody. All right, so moving on to 2.3, measures of the location of data. So this is where we are going to be looking at percentiles and quartiles. So percentiles divide ordered data into hundredths. So you have a bunch of data and kind of like we were doing sending to the calculator and sorting. So if it's ordered from the smallest to the highest, a percentile you know, divides all of that <laughs> into one hundredths. So I have an example here, like a score of 76. If that is the 84th percentile, then that means there are 84% of the students or scores that are less than 76. Okay, so probably all of us at one time or another have taken some sort of a standardized test where we're given a percentile. So it's not just your score on the test, right? So suppose you took this and it was like, a, you know, some standardized 
college entry exam or something like an SAT or an ACT. Those are not scored out of 100, but suppose there was this hypothetical one and you scored a 76 and you might think to yourself, like, that's not very good, right? Like a 76, you kind of think of that as a C. But this now allows you to compare your score to everyone else who took that exam. So you did better than 84% of the students who took that exam, okay? So this kind of reminds me of some of my college classes <laughs> where, you know, sometimes you hear about these classes that are graded on a curve or whatever. Um, and, you know, basically everyone would fail an exam, but if your score was better than like 84%, then you would probably get a B on your test, even if you only got like 25 out of 100. <laughs> In some cases, I could tell some stories. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. Anyways, and quartiles, divide order data into quarters. All right, so we say a value is at the peak percentile when P percent of the data are less than that value. So like 76 is at the 84th percentile because 84% is less. All right, so this is an example of an Alex question um, where you have a bunch of data and they're asking for the 40th and the 75th percentiles. So that means the numbers where 40% is less and the number where 75% is less. Now in Alex, they give you, there are several different methods for finding percentiles. In Alex, they give you a method A and a method B. We're just gonna look at method A. Okay, we're gonna try and just keep it simple. And I feel like, I mean, I wanna say it's the most kind of straightforward way. So these are my little steps here in the pink. You know, you basically order the data and then you take P percent of the N numbers. So if you have 19 entries and you want the 40th percentile, you take 40% of 90, uh, 19, sorry, 40% of 19. Um, and if it's not an integer, Integers are those like roundish numbers, right? It's not an integer because there's that decimal portion. So then you're going to round it up to the next integer, number eight. And so we're looking at what number is in the eighth position, right? If you did get an integer, then you take the mean of that one and the next one. So if you got eight, you would take the mean of, you know, eight and nine. Okay, and here's the 75th percentile. So you take 75% of 19, you get 14.25. So 15 is the next integer rounded up. So you're looking at what number is in the 15th position. Okay, so 75% of these numbers are to the left, right? And that's why we're using, you know, that number N, because you want a certain number, you know, percentage of them to the left. Okay, so let's look at problems 19 through 21. Okay, here are the fuel efficiencies in miles per gallon, got miles per gallon of 15 new cars. What's the percentage of these cars with a fuel efficiency less than 40 miles per gallon? Okay, so you want to order them from least to greatest. 
and you're looking at the percentage that are less than 40. So there are nine out of the total 15. That's 60%. Okay, so 40 miles per gallon is a 60th percentile. 60th percentile, because 60% is to the left. Okay. Right here, test scores for 15 students. What percentage are less than 81? And it's too bad they don't let you send to the calculator so you can, <laughs> you know, order them again. But I guess you can just go ahead and, you know, count them. But they, they do write them from least to greatest. But, you know, you could just circle them. Easy to miss one probably, but so again, they're nine out of 15, so that's 60%. So 81 is called the 60th percentile. Let's see, is there something other than 60 percentage? 60. Let's see. Here are the ages in years of 15 professors at a college. What percentage are younger than 36 years old? This one's easier, right? There are only three younger than 36. That's 20%. So 36 is a 20th percentile for that sample. Okay. The following are the annual salaries of 16 CEOs of major companies. Find the 25th and 70th percentiles. So now they do actually let you send the data to the calculator. So you wanna send the data to the calculator and sort it. And you wanna take 25% of the 16. That's a quarter, so that's four. Just let this person in. So let's let let's see the Alex version. Right, the twenty fifth percentile. Twenty five percent of sixteen is four. Since that's an integer, you take the mean of that one and the next. So the fourth and the fifth observation. You can grab the pen here. Okay. So the means of the numbers in the fourth and fifth places, one, two, three, four, and five. Because again, you want 25%, four of them to the left. Right, so 359.5 is a 25th percentile. It's not the only one, right? It is one number such that 25% is less. Like 370 would also be a 25th percentile because 25% of these data are less than that. Okay, but this is just a method so we all kind of get the same answer. And when you enter it in Alex, you're going to get it marked correctly. And so this is that case where you did not get an integer. Right. You either round up or you take the mean of this one and the next. So I just tried to make it like in few words there. All right, and the next one, the 70th percentile. So you take 70% of 16. <laughs> Just gonna mute everybody here. 
and you get 11.2, which is not an integer. So you round up to 12. And then you look at the number in the 12th position, which is 700. Okay. They, they show another method here as well. Okay. All right, so the following are the PE ratios, price of stock divided by projected earnings, earnings per share for 20 banks. Find again the 20th and the 75th percentiles for those ratios. So, for the 20th percentile, you're going to take 20% of 20. Which is 4. So you're going to take the mean of the numbers in the 4th and the 5th place. I'll do it in a minute. I'll send it. <laughs> and then for, um, well, okay, let's go ahead and do it. So I sent to calculator and then I'm going to sort. One, two, three, four, so 17 is in the fourth place and 18 is in the fifth place. So 17 and 18. So that's 17.5. <laughs> right, it's halfway between there. And then, for the 75th percentile, take 75% of 20. So that's three quarters, so that's 15, right? So again, that's an integer. So you're gonna average the numbers in the 15th and 16th places. And so now it might be easier to count from the right because that's 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15 are both 29. So the average is 29. Oh, I clicked. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I clicked try another instead of check. Okay. Twenty fifth and ninetieth percentiles. So let's do this. Twenty five percent of seventeen. It's frustrating. Sometimes I do solve instead of check by mistake. So that's 4.25. So you're going to round up and we're going to look at the number in the fifth place. So 
sort it. One, two, three, four, five is number 13. Okay. And then the 90th percentile. Ninety percent. Fifteen point three. So you're going to look at the number in the sixteenth place. So almost the last place, right? Send the data, sort it. So not forty, but thirty-seven. Okay. And so, yeah, this is exactly what's in the lecture notes. Just making sure there's nothing extra there. Percentiles, interpreting percentile ranks. So a national chain of department stores ranks its 1,250,000 salespeople by the monetary value of their sales. Wow, that's a lot of salespeople. All right, Christine's sales are at the 17th percentile and Hong sales are at the 23rd percentile. And so then you're gonna get some questions. So which of the following must be true about Christine's sales? So yeah, if she's at the 17th percentile, right? That means 17% are uh, lower and 83% are higher, so she's lower of the sales way down there. And they both had sales lower in value than the median. Let's see another scenario altogether. Government agencies keep data about the income distribution of the population, the Moore family and Patterson family live in a county with 11,000 families. The Morse family income is at the 24th percentile and the Patterson's is at the 77th percentile. So what's true about the Morse family? If they're at the 24th percentile, then 76% earn more than them. And what must be true about both of them? The Patterson family earns more than the Moore family. Is it just one? So it's not true that they're both earning more than the median because the Moores is less than the median. Patterson family, we don't know the actual dollar amounts. Uh, they don't both have incomes in the bottom amount because the Patterson family is in the upper half, right? Okay. So just different types of questions. Okay. Okay. So we talked about these quartiles that divide data into quarters, right? As opposed to percentiles, which divide data into hundredths. 
And so here's an example of data where we can see the minimum, the maximum, the median is also known as that second quartile. So think about quarters of a dollar, right? You have one quarter, you have two quarters, that's half of a dollar. The median is this idea of the middle. And then three quarters, that's also known as the upper quartile. And then the maximum. Okay, so again, the median is the middle number in an ordered list of data. Um, if you have an even number of data, then it's the mean of the middle two. And then the lower quartile is the middle of the bottom half, and the upper quartile is the middle of the top half. And these five numbers are known as a five number summary. So this gives us an idea about how the data is spread out. Um, and from that, we can graph what's called a box plot, which is what section 2.4 is on in the book. So the box plot, it's also called a box and whisker plot or a box whisker plot. So you have the median of data, the lower and upper quartiles forming that box. And then the lowest and highest give you those whiskers. <laughs> And so 25% of the data is out here, 25% of the data is out here, and you've got 50% in the box. Right, 25 here and 25 there. Um, if you take the upper minus the lower, that gives you what's called the interquartile range. So it tells you, you know, how spread out that box is, the length of it. And that's where, again, 50% of the data fall. Okay. So here, it's just asking you to give the median, the lower quartile, and the upper quartile. So here, the temperatures are ordered from least to greatest. So find the median, the lower, and the upper quartiles. So again, the median is that middle. And so how many, we have 14 data. That's an even number. So you're gonna have seven to, numbers to the left and seven numbers to the right and take the average of those two in the middle to get the median. And again, we're just gonna use method one here the lower quartile is the median of the lower half, and the upper quartile is the median of the upper half. So now you have seven on the bottom. That's an odd number. So it's just that middle number. You have seven on the top. That's an odd number. So it's just that middle number. Okay. In this case, method two got the same results. But again, we're just going to do method one. All right, so here you have 11 families. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This is the median here at 22. And then for the lower quartile, it's the middle of the lower half. So it's 11 and the upper quartile it's the middle of the upper half. Mm -hmm. Okay, so listing the five number summary and then that interquartile range. And so it's already listed from smallest to greatest yesterday's high temperature in 12 cities. So now that's 12, that's an even number. So you're gonna average the middle two. 
right? It's going to be six on the left and six on the right. Three, four, five, six. So the median is 68.5. And of course, the, the minimum is 50. And the maximum is 81. And then the lower quartile, so you have six to the left. So it's going to be the average of these two which is 63. And then for the upper quartile, it's the average of these two, which is 71.5. Right. It's the midway point. And then the interquartile range, It's the 71.5 minus 63. So that's eight point, uh, 7.5, mm -hmm. uh, 8.5. Okay. Let's just see, and Alex, I forget if I pulled up one of these or not on the lecture notes. Um, so here we have 14 music teachers. Uh, these are their ages. Thankfully, they've sorted them for you. Otherwise, I feel like that's a waste of time. <laughs> you guys to be sorting. Uh, but yeah, so the minimum and the maximum is really easy. And then the median is that middle. 14 is an even number. So you're going to have seven to the left and seven to the right. And then average or find the midway point. And now you've got seven to the left. So there's a firm middle number. That's your lower quartile, upper quartile. And you can subtract those to get the interquartile range. Outliers. Do I have anything? Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you have a bunch of data that's flustered, you know, nicely, uh, but you have like a few values that are way low or way high. And that's the idea of an outlier. You know, so suppose, for example, on exam one, you know, like most of you guys are going to get A's, B's, and C's. And then there might be one person who gets like a 12. Because like they didn't study, they haven't been here. They just show up and take exam one. Like it's an outlier, right? And sadly, that's going to bring down the average. <laughs> but I'm just saying, that's the idea. Or maybe you live in a neighborhood and most of the home values are like $500,000. But then there's one home where somebody went over the top and they've, you know, added a second story and did a pool and put a back house and blah, blah, blah. And that house is worth like $1.2 million. Right, so that's an outlier in that neighborhood. Um, so that's the idea of an outlier. And then um, there's a precise method for calculating when a value is an outlier for a given set of data. 
as this picture shows, you basically take one and a half times that length of the interquartile range and add it to the upper quartile. Anything more than that is an outlier. You know, you subtract one and a half times that length from the lower quartile, and anything lower than that is an outlier. So again, this interquartile range has a length. So, and this is where, you know, half the data fall. Half the data are between that like score and that score on a test. So maybe half the data lie between like, you know, 75 and 95. And if somebody got like a hundred or somebody got, you know, like a 20, they're outliers, something like that. I'm just making something up off the top of my head. It's usually not very good when I try to do that. Okay, so introduction to finding outliers. The last 10 calls to a customer service support line had the following lengths in minutes. So look, most of these are in the 50s and 60 minutes. And then one call was 15 minutes, one call was 95 minutes. One call was really short, one call was really long. So those two are outliers, okay? Just see what Alex has to say. An outlier is a data value that is much smaller or larger than most of the other values. See, it's like the hazy understanding as opposed to the precise method. We'll show two methods to find outliers. In method one, we simply look at the data to see if any values are much smaller or much larger. And that's what we did. We just said, look, 15 is way smaller, 95 is way larger. Method two, we find that interquartile range. So here we are going through the steps. You have to find the median and then the lower and the upper quartile, subtract those values, and that gives you the interquartile range is 12. And then you take one and a half times that. So that's now 18. So anything more than 18 above the upper quartile or less than 18 below the lower quartile. See, they subtract 18 from the lower, add 18 to the higher. And any of those values are considered outliers. So for this first problem, you know, method one suffices. <laughs> because they, they really try to make it pretty obvious. Okay. Right here, I would say none. Uh, these are 11 scores. They're all in the 70s and 80s. So I would say there are no outliers here. Um, bakery sells 10 types of sandwiches. Here are the calories. Again, I would say there are no outliers, right? These are almost 600, and these are just a little over 600 calories, and that's a lot of calories for a sandwich. <laughs> but there is, so there are no outliers. All right, in a survey, 11 people gave the following ratings for a local politician on a scale from zero to 100. I'm just laughing, look how low they are. <laughs> from zero to 100, right? So most of them are 40 and 50, and one is really low, right? Somebody hates this guy or girl. So 16 is the outlier there. You see what I'm saying? These are pretty obvious and clear, I think. And then using the interquartile range. So this now... They have you walk through and do all the steps. Find the lower and upper quartiles, find the interquartile range, then find the lower and upper boundaries. 
And so you don't have to memorize the formula, right? They give it to you. But find one and a half times the interquartile range, subtract it from the lower, add it to the upper. Okay. And then any values beyond that. So here you got the median is 50, the lower quartile is 41, the upper is 54. So that interquartile range is 13. So you take one and a half times 13, which is 19 and a half. Subtract it from the lower boundary or from the lower quartile to give you a lower boundary. And you add that to the upper quartile to give you an upper boundary. And we can see there's one lower than the lower boundary. So this problem is kind of forcing you to do all the steps, even though you can probably just see 15 as the outlier, right? It's, it wants to make sure you know how to do the process because kind of they are just a little, you know, hard to tell. All right. I'm like, do we want to do one? Um, these are already sorted. There are 11 calls. So the median is going to be right in the middle. One, two, three, four, five to the left and five to the right. So that's the median. The lower quartile is 56 and the upper one is 63. So 63 minus 56 is seven. Now you're gonna take one and a half times seven. Grab 10. All right, one and a half times seven. I mean, one times seven is seven. A half of seven is three and a half. So that's 10 and a half, right? Remember, you can also always use a calculator, but I try to do, um, <laughs> let's try it again. I try and do as much mental math as I can. I have to say though, like, when I don't sleep a lot, I'm so dingy tired. I feel like Sarah, you know, I make a lot of mistakes, right? I don't know. <laughs> but I try. I try to do, the more you do, the better you get at it. And so what if you make a mistake, right? You can always erase. It's all good. So um, the lower boundary, you do Q1, that's 56, minus. 10.5. So the lower boundary, like help me out. I really do get a little brain dead. So that's going to be 45.5. Uh, Am I right? That'll be 55.5. And okay. <laughs> All right. And then the next one, you have 63 plus the one and a half times. So let me just say this is uh, one and a half times IQR, right? So plus 10.5, so that's 73.5. Okay, so anything lower than 45.5? Nope. 
anything higher than 73.5, right? You have a lower boundary, 45.5, and the higher boundary of 73.5, but there's nothing. So all that work, <laughs> and there are no outliers. But that, you know, it's useful to know. Okay. That's music to my ears when I see the correct show up after. I always remember in this graduate class, some of you may have heard this story before, but we had wraparound whiteboards all the way around the class. And um, it was a huge class. And my professor was doing a problem. He started in the upper left-hand corner and went all the way down. And it was a long problem and he got way back here and someone said, she's been a negative and, and everybody just grew <laughs> It was just so horrible, horrible. And like, why didn't you say something? <laughs> so I say this too, like if you guys see something before I go through like all the steps, it would just be helpful, you know what I'm saying? So, all right. And then constructing a box and whiskers plot. Pretty simple once you have that five number summary. Um, so let's sort it. Right, the highest is 31. Now notice when I grab this, the number shows up up at the top because sometimes it's kind of hard to see the little hash marks. And the lowest is five. And then how many? They're 19, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> why don't I do a problem with smaller numbers? So, you know, you're going to do this for the median and then these two for the upper and lower uh, quartiles, right? So 21 is in the middle. So you're going to have, um, it'll be the 10th number, right? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that 18, 9, 10? So that's that 21. And so um, you'll have nine to the left. So the fifth one, if I did that right, should be the, the lower quartile. Right, et cetera, et cetera. Let me pull up the Alex explanation even. It's nice when they show it and do it like with color too. So here they have it sorted. Because again, I, I don't like that the calculator doesn't give it all and keep it there so I could write on it. It's really frustrating. There's the smallest, there's the highest, there's the median. Here's the middle of the lower nine. See, there are nine on the left, nine to the right. That's 18 and one in the middle, that's 19. Okay. So that's the median, the lower quartile, the upper quartile, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay. And so again, 25% of the data falls between 13 and 21, 25% of the data between 21 and 25, 25% of the data out here and 25% of the data out there. So it gives us an idea of the spread of the data, okay? And I see we're almost out of time. We go to 505, right? There's just one more. Let me just do it real quick. And then um, on Thursday, um, we can we can still go over more stuff, Q and A, et cetera. Um, all right. So comparing two data sets, the noon temperatures in Fahrenheit for two cities were recorded over a given month. So you got city A and city B. Right. You can compare like the medians and et cetera, et cetera. Which city had the highest noon temperature? So clearly city A, right? Which city had more noon temperatures above 78? So here's 78, right? This is that upper quartile. Even though this line is longer, it still has 25% of the data. 
this still has 25% of the data. So they both have the same number of data, okay? Which city had noon temperatures with a larger interquartile range? And so that's this length is bigger, right, than that length. So city B. Which city had a larger median? And clearly city A did. Okay, so it'll be asking me questions like that. Okay, so I finished. <laughs>